Well, I think we'll get started and we'll, we'll insert him when he comes. Um, uh, Vinny, we're about to get started. That's it. Introducing. Right. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Margaret Cooper of the League of Women Voters of Falmouth. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening at our annual get together with our hardworking state legislators. This evening we have Senator Vinnie DiMacito, Representative David Vieira, and Representative Dylan Fernandez. First, I need to give you the commercial. Uh, first of all, we thank FCV to FCTV for being here. They are, we're not live tonight, but they will rebroadcast this event several times over the next month, and we thank you for bringing this event to our whole community. The League has a wide reputation for being nonpartisan regarding political parties and candidates. We arrange candidates night, and there will be one here tomorrow in this very room. We conduct voter registration drives, so we can't be partisan when it comes to either people or parties. However, we can and we do take action on political issues, public policy issues that we have studied, discussed, and decided whether we will oppose or support them. We can take action at the local level, the state level, or the national level. But bear in mind, all the discussions where we make our decisions are conducted right here in Falmouth or in other localities across either the state or the entire country. Based on that practice, we're going to try something different this evening. We're an experimenting. You're used to the traditional Q&A where you ask questions of our legislators. We're going to do that for the last half of the program, the last 45 minutes. For the first 45 minutes, we're going to wear our lobby hats and we're going to discuss specific issues that are priority for our league. It's not our entire program because we support many issues, but we've selected four of them. Those four are voter registration, <laughs> Voter registration, affordable housing, the decriminalization of poverty, which is a justice issue, and finally, the energy omnibus bill. Each issue will be introduced by a league member, and we're going to have, and then the legislators will discuss it and tell us what you think, and we hope you can persuade us to, we can persuade you to, to vote for these bills. Well, we can persuade you? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. I'm just, well, that, I'm that, that's fair, yeah, that's no, fair. Yeah, sure. And um, each bill will get 10 minutes. Three minutes, the uh, league member will introduce the issue, and then for the other seven, you guys can mix it up. The timing is going to work this way. We have a timer right here, John Carroll, thank you, is going to nudge me after nine minutes. I will stand up and sit down. That gives everybody a one minute warning. Then after 10 minutes, I'm gonna stand up and remain standing, just so they know what's going on, and it'll be up to the person speaking to wind up his sentence, and we'll move on to the next issue. The first up is Joanne Treisman. 
you have this is going to work? We'll see. Good evening, and thank you, Senator DiMacito, Representative Vieira, and Representative Fernandez for coming. Tonight we're going to be talking about the Automatic Voter Registration Act on which you will be voting soon. It has come out of committee, and um, we are hoping that you will consider supporting this, something that's been discussed and supported by the Massachusetts League of Women Voters. Automatic voter registration has come out of the legislature and, and you need to vote before July, the end of July on this, on this act. The League believes that voting is a fundamental right of citizenship and must be guaranteed. In support of this, the League has historically backed legislation to remove obstacles to voting and voter registration. Remember, the history of voting rights for women is less than 100 years where we've had the right to vote. The, um, the automatic voter registration involves automatically registering eligible citizens to vote unless they opt out. It works this way. Citizens are registered when they interact with the Registrar of Motor Vehicles, Mass Health, or other state agencies, for example, to update their address or change names. It differs from the Motor Voter Act because it automatically registers rather than asks if you want to register or someone forgets to ask if you want to register. Citizens can opt out of this registration at that point or later on. Massachusetts would also join the Electronic Registration Information Center or ERIC. This is a nonprofit organization that's owned, managed, and funded by the member states, not the federal government. The current membership is 23 states. New Jersey recently passed this and, and joined. I have a list of all the other states that are involved. Required information is electrically, tra electronically transferred to a central voter registry protected by encrypted security. And that information for citizens is then forwarded to the Secretary of State and the local clerks. Non-citizens are automatically deleted. That's as if someone tries to register and they find that they have not, uh, they are not currently registered, they are currently not citizens. With no additional paperwork, this eliminates errors from duplicate registrations when people move. It's more secure and cost effective than current methods. Now, currently in Massachusetts, there are estimated to be 680,000 eligible voters who are not registered to vote. Let me tell you about Oregon. That was the first state to implement this ERIC program. They found 230,000 voters in the first six months and that, that registered in the first six months. And in the next election, they increased their voter turnout by 4.1%. And they found 570,000 addresses that needed to be updated. So this cleans out some of the registration, some of the, you know, it's, it's a way of making sure that there's no fraud going on. <clears throat> we all know that there, I think the last election there was a, a first daughter that was registered in Pennsylvania and New York. So that wouldn't happen anymore. I tried to put some humor in here. <laughs> The League hopes that we can count on your support, representatives and senators, to vote making the right to register more accessible and more accurate. The automatic voter registration is part of the solution to helping ensure everyone's voter registration is accurate and up to date. We invite you now to share your thoughts. Who wants to start? Senator? The senior member. See, that Senator. Go. Age to beauty, apparently. Um, so 
obviously, anything that we can do to get people more active in voting, uh, we certainly want to do that. And so we supported it. I know we, not too long ago, did this whole uh, thing about early voting, and that's really turned out to be quite a success. And initially, we didn't know how it was going to play out. Some, you know, the clerks are a little bit uh, challenged by that because of the costs and whatnot. Um, but, but nonetheless, it, it's clearly been a success. And I think that this is just another example of an opportunity um, to get more people active and in voting because that's what we want. We want a real reflection of our entire society when it comes to voting. Um, so I think it's uh, it's fair to say that um, this seems to have you know pretty pretty strong support in regards to addressing uh, the voting issue, getting people there, and then and then of course. At the end of the day, people still have to make the action of actually going out and voting. As, as you said, 230,000 in, um, in Oregon, and it went up 4%, which is exciting. It's gone up it 4%. How, you know, that being said, there was probably a lot of that 230 that still, even after being registered, didn't, um, didn't participate. And that's just something we need to do a better job of letting people know how important it is to have a, an opportunity to vote and have a say in your, uh, in your democracy. So that's my Thank opinion. Thank you. I think we have yeah. Yes. So, so I agree with the concept. What I want to see is uh, what the final version looks like when it comes to the House because of one of the provisions you mentioned, the opt-out provision, um, for those individuals who choose not to participate. And of course, all of us in this room are participants, and we want to encourage participation, civic engagement. We're going to do a civics education uh, initiative by, by the end of this session uh, in the legislature. Uh, but for those individuals, for whichever we reason, make a choice that they do not want to participate. Many of them that I met uh, this last couple of months while I was out getting signatures. Are you registered to vote? No. Do you, do you live here? Are you a citizen? Yes, but I'm just I'm not interested in registering to vote. That's a choice that individuals have in a democracy. Uh, and so making sure that individuals have the choice to opt out. Um, so you, when you ask that question at the Registry of Motor Vehicles, do you want to register to vote? See, they don't, so that won't happen now. So, but you said there's an opt out provision. So are they right. going to ask you before they put your name no, into the no, central what data? No, they're going to do is say, I have registered to you, you to vote as a voter in the state. Would you like to opt out? If you, or. I don't know what the training is going to look like, but if you wish Devil's not always to, in the details. So right. if we're going no, to give you, individuals an option to absolutely. opt out, they need to know that they have the right to exercise the option. Right. So by utilizing all of these various uh, interactions with government to uh, help individuals register, absolutely in favor of that. Going to the ERIC system, I think it should be federally mandated, actually, that we use the ERIC system throughout the United States so that we make sure that any type of voter fraud folks registering in multiple states is minimized or eliminated. Well, uh, I, I think, think that's people feel that they don't want the federal government involved. I didn't in realize this was a back and forth. I right. Think. Yeah, it is a back three and forth. seven. <laughs> Sorry, I, I guess I under with me, anyhow, misunderstood I don't the know format. The other speakers, but. Um, and then the last thing is a challenge that I have for the league. Um, we supported uh, the early voting uh, in Massachusetts in the state elections. And I think the league has a challenge now to make sure that when you schedule your candidates' nights, that you schedule them before the early voting period commences. When you conducted your last candidates' night, over 3,000 individuals had voted in my district, and you were the first and only candidates' night forum in the 3rd Barnstable District. And yet 3,000 of our voters had already voted and never had the opportunity to benefit from a candidates' night. So I just would hope that in collaboration uh, that we could it's make sure that we back totally that up noted. and do it before, totally the, before the 10 day period. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the League for putting this on. It's a, it's a great discussion. And uh, it's great to be here with these guys to talk about the issues. Uh, when it comes to automatic voter registration, I very much support it. Uh, my name's on the House version of the bill. Um, as a co-sponsor, I think it's really important that we break down all break down barriers to accessing uh, the right to vote. And we make sure that especially young people are able to vote. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of young people become really involved in the political process over the past year. But, uh, you know, when it comes to automatically registering people to vote, that breaks down barriers that are largely, that largely affect uh, younger voters because there's a lot of transients. You're going to college, you're, you know, out of, you're, you're moving around a lot. Uh, when you're in your youth. So there's a lot of barriers to voting uh, for people from 18 to, to 30, and this helps break down a lot of those barriers. It's a really important piece. Um, to echo the uh, comments 
uh, Vinny and David, you know, early voting was a huge success. Huge success. I think everyone here loved it. I voted on the first day. I voted up for myself before the league forum. Luckily, I had I already had my I already had my name. My, my, my I, yeah, I, I had my mind made up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Everybody has to vote for him and then they have to opt out. So. That's right. I like that policy. We should. That might be a good amendment. Um, you know, there, and there's a lot of things we need to approve upon in voting. I think we should have weekend voting. Um, you know, I'm really open in, open to lowering uh, the voting age. Uh, you know, there's been talk about lowering the voting age to 16 as part. It's, it's part of come out with these high school students getting more getting more involved in the process. I mean, I really think it's important that we give them high schoolers more of a say in the process because it's their future that they're voting on. Um, and, you know, I, you know, kind of on a, con a controversial piece, you know, I, I'm honestly open to looking at, into mandating voting, um, which is what Australia does. Uh, it might be ruled unconstitutional, but, you know, it's mandatory that you have jury duty. You can't opt out of that. That is a civic duty that's absolutely mandatory. And so I think, you know, I, I'm open to looking into the way Australia does things and mandating voting as well. So that's a little farther uh, out there, but um, something that I'm certainly open to. Well, just for that point, um, I was at the Human Rights Academy last week, and I took my voter registration forms, which I always carry, and I gave them out to 16-year-olds who were very excited that they could pre-register to vote. So that's, that is something we already have in Massachusetts, and they were very appreciative. And I think many of us in the league are working very hard. Well, not pre-registering, I'm saying just right. voting. But I mean just yeah. to say that they were excited that yeah. they could even pre-register. Yeah. So it uh, sounds like it, you're going to have to work out the details as it, as it gets brought to the um, respective House or Senate. But uh, any other questions that you have or that you want to bring up, or shall we move on? Uh, it, sorry, yeah. I would just say, you know, the impediment to this is just there's a, there's a cost associated with it. $25,000 membership fee. And, <laughs> and we got to pay it. Yeah. We got to pay it. And, and the other 23 states have already agreed to pay it. And as more states join. Oh, no, no. I'm not talking about Eric. That's only the Eric. I'm oh, talking Eric. about there's a cost for our towns to implement this. And we, have, we go through a really tight budget cycle every year. It's really tight. There's going to be a cost associated with this. There was a, a large cost associated with early voting. And guess what? The legislature didn't pay the towns until a year later after the auditor, uh, the auditor bump ruled that it was an unfunded mandate. So, you know, yes, we need these things, but we also need a mechanism to pay for them. Uh, and without that, they're going to hit a roadblock. I understand. Thank you very much. And I believe that we are going to move on now and listen to Olivia Smith. I mean, Olivia White. Smith, White there's no, if there's no Elizabeth Smith, I'll take Elizabeth White. It's one of those common names. In case my husband is wondering, I am Olivia White and not Smith. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm here to talk about my uh, passion, which is affordable housing. And... No, I'm going in the wrong direction. That's it. Since we planned this meeting about a month ago, one of the funding bill, which was $1.7 billion, have been passed through the House and Senate. So I have to take out all of the names. But we are really pushing for the uh, affordable housing bill and how to fund for it. Now, since we had that one month to be thinking about. And when I was doing all the research, I found out that there are several affordable housing bills that are being discussed in the House and the Senate with different numbers, with different provisions. So I'm not going to ask for one bill that I want you to support, but I'm going to be talking about in general as to what we are really looking for. As I studied these bills, I found that there are some very important provisions, the provisions that the league really support. For example, most of the housing bill 
they are really encouraging that they build more affordable housing. And when we talk affordable housing, we are talking about people who are low income or middle income people. Another provision that we hear about is that any residential unit that have to be built now, they must have 25% of the houses that have to be affordable and may be designated for that. Also, there are provisions for zoning. If you have seen and heard about zoning, there are all kinds of hurdles that one has to move through before you can have zoning laws that have to be changed. There are some provisions that actually allows for accessory units in single family home where people can either add to their house, they can rent their uh, a room, or different kind of provision just using in their own home. There are also a, some community scale housing initiative, particularly there's an initiative that is a joint initiative of Department of Housing and Community Development in Massachusetts Housing. And this joint effort of these two provides for some financial incentive. So if there is a financial incentive that the builders will be more likely to build some affordable housing. Now, if we look at the Massachusetts law, Massachusetts created a right to housing. This is a right to shelter state. What it says is that if you're gonna live in Massachusetts, you have a right to have shelter. Now just think about it. I just attended recently a study that was done by Cape Cod Commission. And the study predicts that in the next 10 years, the population of Cape Cod is going to tremendously increase. Now what that means is if population is going to increase, there's going to be the need for more housing. Same thing, not too long after that, I attended another meeting of uh, another group, and they were, and it was actually the Falmouth Community Preservation Community meeting. They also found out that the major need is for housing. And they emphasized that we need to have better planning, we need to reduce barriers in developing these affordable housing and have provisions for funding. Now, I had the privilege of working with faith communities three years ago. And in that time that we were trying to place homeless people here in Falmouth, that group now in three years later is known as now, we call it as belonging to each other. And thank you, David Vieira, because I had the ple pleasure of working with you when we got together and came up with a program where we will house these homeless people for three hard winter months. And the program has been very, very successful. And I also want at this time to take, thank my representative Dylan Fernandez for all your happen. Because thank you Dylan for sponsoring the bill that directly affects and benefits Falmouth. We appreciate it and thank you for securing $40,000 for homeless people here in our district for this year of 2018, and it's for that we really appreciate it. So my question to three of you is that I want you to discuss what are some of the provisions that you heard or even the provisions that are not in here that you will support and you'd like to see in the upcoming housing bills or funding bills. So it's interesting that just this afternoon, the House and Senate appointed uh, the conference committee for the housing bond bill. So we've taken the initial chamber votes, but the housing bond bill is not law yet. So we need to get that to the end run uh, because it requires a roll call vote in the legislature because it is a bond bill. So we're almost there with that. Uh, some of the provisions uh, that you mentioned in the, in the previous slide uh, brought the, the zoning changes. You know, we've been talking about comprehensive zoning reform in Massachusetts for a number of years in the legislature. And one of the things that's really been um, an issue with the discussion around the comprehensive zoning reform proposals that we had were that they were the changing the threshold of voting to change a zoning bylaw in a community. Right now it's required two thirds. And many of the provisions were looking at changing that to either a majority or another percentage 
as determined by the municipality. Many of us in the legislature uh, were adamantly opposed to changing that threshold because of the history of that supermajority. Zoning bylaws are laws in your municipality which control your free exercise of your personal private property. And when the collective community is going to impose additional limitations on your exercise of your private property, it should be for a gr great public purpose, and therefore it should have to garner a supermajority vote in the municipal legislature to make those restrictions. But what's unique in this last round, many of you have heard of the uh, Housing Choice Bill that Governor Baker proposed. Within the Housing Choice Bill is a series of voting requirements which allow greater density, which allow the synergies and allow the economics to play in favor of affordable housing. And if you think about it, when you increase density or allow density to be increased, you are expanding personal property rights rather than constricting them. And so when it comes to zoning changes, looking at affordable housing options, I am more than willing to allow the municipalities to make that choice, a local option, if you would like to change that threshold to empower your community to set up these areas where the development is uh, good, where you can get the biggest, what they say, bang for the buck, making sure the infrastructure is there to support affordable housing. We know that when we build affordable housing, we want to make sure there's other community supports in that area. So we don't want to build community housing out in the middle of the woods, nowhere off side of but public transit and all of that, we want to make sure that individuals have access to the other infrastructure that they need. So definitely in favor of that. Um, and just the last one I'll mention, the 25% of residential units in all new development. I'm not sure exactly which, which bill that, is that in 3845 itself? Well, there were two or three bills that okay. had been yeah. provisioned, so it um, lumped them all together, but one of the bill was at 3845. Was 35, yeah. I, I, I can't, from a legislative position, uh, make a law that says every time you build a development you have to have a certain percentage. What I can vote for is to say if you do a minimum of 25 percent in your development, these are the incentives that we'll get for you to build denser in these areas. Okay. Uh, but with the economics and, and the housing market and the interest rates, I can't tell a developer by state statute that you have to do 25 percent and then find out the finance mechanisms don't work and you know how long it takes to get yes. a bill through the legislature so much for affordable housing because they can't afford to do it so in the spirit of 25 incentives I'm in favor of that great um, well thank you for bringing up this issue oh well, really all right uh -oh. Talk fast. Oh, that's a one minute okay yeah I'll just so I actually had a, a lot I wanted to add to this but uh, I'll be really brief um you know this is a huge issue for my district average home price on nantucket is 2.4 million dollars the vineyard hovers around a million i i'm going to be renting for the rest of my life in falmouth because i can't even afford uh, to own a home here so i'm very invested in this affordable <laughs> housing issue um i'm a co-sponsor of the smart growth bill uh sarah peak uh our terrific uh cape colleague uh is is one of the key sponsors of that um, it's all about kind of b smart growth in downtown areas. There's the, the places that people love across my district, downtown Nantucket, downtown Falmouth, you know, OB, um, OB downtown. A lot of these places, because of our zoning restrictions, you cannot have another kind of mixed use, uh, uh, kind of uh, a beautiful mixed use, kind of high density area. And so what this bill does is it allows you to have those mixed use units, and it says that they should be in a downtown kind of business development uh, area and uh, it makes it so that you are built you know it's smart growth you're not putting a, a single house on an acre plot of land and calling it affordable housing you're putting and it depends if you count as a rural or you count as a, a kind of an urban area um, i believe it's eight units per acre for rural and i think it's 15 units per acre um, for urban. That makes a lot of sense, especially when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, having more housing options. You know, I don't want a home on an acre plot of land. Like I am very happy to live in an apartment. And we just, the biggest issue, if you ask the realtors on the Cape and Islands, their biggest challenge 
is lack of housing stock. We have a real problem here and we need to preserve our green space. That's why we all love it here. And the way to increase housing stock to meet our demand while preserving green space is to have higher density in areas where that are already high density, as David said. You don't wanna be building out in the woods with high density. You wanna be building in a downtown area where people have access to shopping, they have access to jobs, they have access to transportation. And by the way, all of that is mentioned in the smart growth bill. So supportive of it. I, I've been working on a number of initiatives. Senator Sear and I filed a first time home buyer savings account bill, which I could get into, but it sounds like we don't have enough time. Um, and then I've also been working on a home rule petition from Nantucket that puts a transaction fee on home sales over $2 million to go towards an affordable housing bank. So any home sale over $2 million, which is a lot on Nantucket, right? Because that's actually below the average, crazy, um, goes towards an affordable housing bank. I think it's more than fair to be asking people who are spending money on a $2 million home, likely buying or selling their second or third home to pitch in a small percentage for the rest of us to afford. The only other piece I'll add to this is that um, and I was looking at the bill. I believe it go. I believe affordable goes up to 100, 110 percent AMI. That's a real problem, right, for the Cape and Islands. A lot. I have doctors that can't find places to live in my district, right? So we need to be we need to be thinking uh, well above 110 percent AMI when it comes to affordable housing for the Cape and Islands. Sorry. I, I would like to ask for Senator. Yes, at I least you can have a little I appreciate. Time. Thank you so much. I sorry that I'm going a little past. Yeah, I hope the um, senators know the. Representative of they just talk too much. That's the so problem. You know, so <laughs> you're, you're absolutely correct. I, yeah. I think time and time again, we hear the story in regards to the fact that there just isn't enough housing stock. I, I mean, I've been to more symposiums that talk specifically about the fact that we in Massachusetts have not done a good job of uh, building houses. And I think one of the big issues is our zoning uh, laws, and they clearly need to be ad addressed. Um, one of the things that uh, the administration and the, uh, the governor was really uh, concerned about is how do we ad address this? He's committed this housing bond bill, $1.7 billion, committed to creating 135,000 new homes in the next seven years. Not all affordable housing, but workforce housing and, and the like, but to, it, to encourage more, uh, you know, bigger densities or, or smaller densities to be able to do that. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and, and one of the biggest successes, and you know, when the, you're know, talking to the governor that he's most proud of, and it's not the fact that GE's coming here or Amazon or the unemployment rate's low, it's the fact that when he took office, there were 3,000 people that lived uh, in homeless shelter, that lived in uh, motels and hotels, uh, homeless people. Do you know how many there are today after a, a three, three and a half years later? 41. 41. He has systematically worked with his Secretary of Housing and Economic Development one by one to get people out of motels and hotels where k young kids are in a, in a room where there's no cooking utensils, no place to go, do your homework, you're living in one square room, um, and they've put them in uh, appropriate housing uh, to get them through the homeless shelters or in, into homes. And I think that that's um, a commitment that I think uh, has made a huge difference because I think we all understand having a roof over your head is probably the most important thing that someone can have, uh, you know, as far as ne next to food. Uh, and to that extent, uh, they, they, he's really made a real commitment, and I've been honored to work with him. He's taken the lead on this $1.7 billion dollar. Uh, housing, uh, housing bond bill, and I think it's going to make some difference. There's, there's a whole bunch of other issues that I know we talk about, but there's some exciting stuff that is happening in this, and, uh, and I think that we're moving in the right direction and going to make a difference because, as you said, everybody's talking about the fact that we need to do a better job about creating housing. Thank you very much, and I'll ask Liz Brown to come and speak this time. Or Liz, yeah, Liz, Liz, Liz Brown, whatever. We keep it simple, though. All right. So I'm, uh, I'm talking about decriminalization of poverty. And a lot has happened in this arena since we originally scheduled this. It's actually become law. So we're going to have a little celebration. Oh, maybe. I shouldn't do that. So thank you for passing this. It was, it was broadly. Uh, uh, there was quite a, a bit of support for it. And just to kind of give you some brief background, the bills, well, I guess it's the law, 
uh, acknowledges and addresses the fact that the way Massachusetts was applying fines and fees uh, was disproportionately increasing jail time for those in poverty. Um, hold on, let me just, I don't know why I'm having trouble here. It doesn't matter. I, just to sort of briefly uh, touch on some of the things that, that the bill, or that the, the law is doing now. Um, it's decreasing some of the fines and fees for individuals or families who don't have the means and prohibits incarceration solely for non-payment of fines and fees if it would cause financial hardship. And it gives judges some flexibility to consider the ability of defendants to pay fines and fees um, and to explore alternatives. Um, it increases the felony larceny threshold. Uh, it, we had one of the lowest in the US. Uh, minor fractions really shouldn't be deemed as felonies, and this has changed that. Um, and it increases ours from being one of the lowest in the country um, to 1,500, which is still lower than Texas and Wisconsin. Um, so we're keeping uh, first time and youthful nonviolent offenders from custody and the negative impacts on their futures. And then lastly, you're seeking to reduce rec recidivism uh, because it limits the release of sealed juvenile data and enables police to divert individuals committing minor infractions instead of arresting them. So it's just generally, in, it was something uh, definitely supported by the League of Women Voters and something I think um, you guys embraced. And so what I thought I would do, so I'm pressing the right, there we go. So the final, uh, final bill received strong support in both houses. It was recently signed into law. And so I just wanted to let you all talk about uh, how you voted and why, and if you thought there were any other reforms to our justice system that you see as priorities going forward. I, I voted for it. We done or uh, no? <laughs> uh, we could. Be. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this, I, I think this is uh, maybe my proudest vote in the legislature. That and um, uh, I put that in millionaires tax kind of right next to each other. This is probably uh, the largest piece of legislation that we will take up this year. The bill is huge. There's a lot to unpack. You could spend a couple of weeks uh, talking about all the different components outlined in this bill. Um, you mentioned some of the really terrific ones. Uh, and you know, I think this is a long time coming. Uh, I think when, and I think when the rest of the country uh, looks at what Massachusetts has done, they're going to take our lead. Uh, you know, nationally, you know, we're an international embarrassment when it comes to our prison population. The United States has the largest prison population in the history of humanity. Um, there's more uh, black men in our criminal justice system today than there were black men slaves at the height of slavery. There's all these really kind of compelling statistics that show how necessary it is that we uh, beat back against what I th look at as uh, really backwards uh, over uh, harsh criminalization laws of the 1990s. You know, it's very clear that we're not gonna incarcerate ourselves to a better society. And this, this law is all about having a more just, more compassionate, more empathetic, uh, society and I, I'm just really proud that Massachusetts took the lead on this. I, this was a bill and I'm really proud of the overwhelming support it got in the legislature and, and that the governor uh, signed it without sending it back at all. You know, I think that that speaks to the overwhelming support behind it. There's a couple pieces. I don't know if you mentioned the sealing of records. That is a huge, did you? Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Take no. it back. Did you mention solitary? All right, so it reforms <laughs> solitary. It, was, it, it helps reform solitary confinement. Um, I don't, you know, look, I, you know, I, I really struggle with solitary. A part of me really thinks that sol we shouldn't have solitary at all, and that's a form of torture. Um, but there, after talking with people in this, uh, in the prison system, there is a small, small subsection of inmates that are really not rehabable that will do harm to others no matter what. And so 
this does reform solitary from what we had it and it, it makes it so that people in solitary have regular reviews uh, which is really important because before that people could be in solitary i believe it was up to 10 years which is crazy without a review um uh so you know and I, i'm still i'm still kind of working out my my entire stance on whether we should abolish it altogether but i was fine to vote with keeping it for a, a small subset of really dangerous uh inmates uh, one piece that didn't make in that I was making in the bill to get to your point on kind of a, a, a future step um, is the Romeo and Juliet law. This made it through on the Senate side, did not make it through on the House side. For those who don't know what that is, that is if someone is 16 and dating, I believe, a 17 year old, that could be counted as statutory rape, right? I was, when I was 16, I had a 17 year old girlfriend. Um, you know, Legally, her, my parents could have taken her to court, right? Because that's, that is actually statutory rape in Massachusetts. And we've seen that be abused, actually, in our school system and in, um, uh, and in Massachusetts. So I think that is a, a, a nice next step. Um, and, and look, I, you know, it's a terrific piece of legislation. I'm proud to support it. And I think much like... Uh, uh, much like uh, legalizing uh, gay marriage, much like our Global Warming Solutions Act, much like our health care law. I think the nation, this, this criminal justice reform package is truly nation-leading legislation that the rest of the country will look to and catch up maybe 10, 10 years down the line, hopefully a little quicker than that. So I, I supported the legislation as well, and it's actually, um, it, it's part of us being in the lead, but it's part of us looking at what was working in other states. Uh, in a bipartisan way, the Senate President, uh, the Speaker of the House, and the Governor uh, went and commissioned with the Council on State Governments to uh, do an in-depth analysis and to look at best practices in criminal justice uh, systems and reforms around the United States, and then to uh, put together a package of recommendations of specific changes that we should see within the Commonwealth. And so uh, this bill is really um, some initiative uh, here uh, from folks within the Commonwealth, but a lot of uh, research and data analysis of what was working in other states. Uh, believe it or not, uh, Texas, uh, which you think, you know, real mandatory minimum sentences, tough on crime, and that was their mantra in the 90s, tough on crime, right? Um, now we're transitioning from tough on crime to smart on crime. And Texas is actually closed to state prisons because of the reforms that they did when they repealed uh, mandatory minimum sentences in certain areas and looked at ways to support the rehabilitation of individuals that had committed crimes for which previously uh, they would have had mandatory minimum sentences in state prisons. Um, just to give you a little tidbit of, of one thing we can do, and we did it uh, uh, on an amendment in the House um, that I sponsored with 51. I brought 51 uh, Republicans and Democrats together in Massachusetts. We have a statute that was written in the 1820s, Chapter 127 of the General Laws, that says that a pretrial detainee who's in a jail and a convicted inmate in a jail cannot be in the same programmatic and housing unit areas. Sheriff Cummings here in Barnstable County, a few of the other sheriffs in the Department of Corrections at the state we're doing drug treatment programs, residential substance abuse treatment programs with pretrial detainees with their general population. Because in some cases, folks are sitting in, in a jail for months or a year awaiting a trial. And now we've got idle time, we've got a captive audience. If folks have a, a drug uh, issue, why shouldn't we be giving them the treatment programs necessary to try to turn their lives around? Because if they don't get convicted, at least they've had the programs. If they do get convicted of whatever other crime they committed, they'll be able to continue with the program that they've already begun during the time that they were a pretrial detainee. And so we were able to do that. Um, it, it was uh, an interesting uh, political maneuvering and uh, parliamentary maneuvering. So those of you that want to hear that story, I can tell it offline at some point. Um, but we're going to be working with the Senate um, to move it forward. And I'm actually meeting uh, with the Secretary of Public Safety tomorrow to uh, discuss how we implement it in the Commonwealth. Thank you. I supported the uh, the final version of the bill as well. Um, I will say that initially when it went through the, the Senate, there were some provisions that I was really concerned about um, that I thought uh, 
didn't make sense. They did actually didn't survive the conference committee, and so um, you know ultimately what ended up being uh, being there made a lot of sense. And that's the beauty of the legislative process. It's really uh, a long process of bringing people together, finding consensus, and then moving forward and putting the best piece of legislation on the table. And and I think that this this happened. I mean, there's still some uh, issues that, that that I think need to be addressed. Um, and I think one of them specifically, and I think we all became. Uh, pretty, uh, so, so yes, I support it, but what some of the priorities I see is, um, I, I think we all know what happened not too long ago here in Yarmouth and our, on, in Cape Cod, and we, we saw a situation with a, a gentleman who clearly had a pretty excessive um, criminal record uh, and was still out on the streets. And, um, and at the same token, we have to find that balance because what we find here is as much as we need to do a better job, and I think we're going to do a better job of this bill, there are still victims. And there are people whose lives uh, can be uh, put in harm's way. And I think when, when I, I don't think there was any one of us that wasn't moved to our knees uh, when we heard the situation of Sergeant Gannon and, and, and the, the frustration that a lot of people felt and reached out to all of us. And we, you know, we've reached out and sent a letter um, to the Judiciary Committee to talk, about, uh, to talk about how did that happen and why did that happen. And I mean, clearly gun charges, assault, you know, how is somebody out, out on the streets like that? So we need to do a better job about re rehabilitation and we have to have, so if there's anything for the future, the future is really digging down and how does, some, how does somebody else get out there? Because sometimes these bad people, they're out on the streets and they're going to hurt more people and we have to find that balance, so. Yeah, and d would you support a red flag? Is that what they're called, the or, red flag? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. that, yeah. that, it's a separate, yeah. so let's right. separate piece. In this but, particular but, instance, it seems yeah. as though that might have been yeah, well, something. It, I, I think the, the, the weapon that he had, though, was, 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 was he was in violation. He shouldn't have had that weapon, so it wasn't something that was legal. And in, in that case, mm -hmm. he's actually had uh, cases against him where he was using a weapon where he should have been under federal statute in jail and so mm -hmm. um it, it's very it's very challenging but there is clearly some issues that i think we all know we have to do a better job with that yeah, that one really well. jumped out so, okay. yeah all right well thank you very much and um okay. we'll move on now to pam baloney oh see what happens if i push this yep there you go I'm here to talk about energy. Most of the energy bills supported by the League of Women Voters of Massachusetts and coalition partners were held for this session, but their key elements and, and much more have been combined into a new energy bill, S. Senate 2302, an act to promote a clean energy future. It's a huge bill, it's got a lot in it, but it's an act to protect our public health, create jobs, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This bill provides a comprehensive program for achieving the emissions reduction targets that were mandated 10 years ago by the 2008 Global Warming Solutions Act. It was expected to pass the Senate relatively intact but um, I understand it still sits with Senate Ways and Means. Once passed by the Senate, it will then go to the House for its consideration. The Massachusetts League of Women Voters and the Falmouth League urge you to support this legislation. Uh, here's the next slide. Our League of Women Voters priorities for strong energy legislation are carbon pricing to reduce emissions and promote renewable energy adoption while protecting low and moderate income people. Putting a price on carbon pollution is rightfully viewed as a strategy for combating climate change. It exerts an immediate impact when adopted. A roadmap that includes interim targets for 2030 and 2040 is based on technologically and economically feasible actions across all sectors and outlines the recommended manner of reductions, extent of reductions, and timelines. Protections for envir environmental justice populations, elimination of caps on solar net metering, 
which have stymied adoption of solar energy. An annual 3% increase in the renewable portfolio standard. Right now it's 1%, and 3% would help us catch up with other states that have made that much increase. Modernizing the electric grid to become a smart grid and reforming the Department of Public Utilities to ensure transparent process and responsiveness to public input. This bill provides an opportunity to pass renewable energy and environmental justice legislation this session. The Massachusetts League and locally the Falmouth League encourage passage of a strong, comprehensive energy bill. And this bill, Senate Omnibus Energy Bill S2302, to protect our public health, create jobs, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions is our best hope. I'd like to hear from our legislators how they plan to vote and why. And Senator DiMacito, can you give us an update on this bill? Do you support it? Sure. Uh, sure. So uh, the update in regards to this is that, you know, as you said, that this is a piece of legislation that the um, chair of the committee, Senator Pacheco, basically took all pieces of legislation uh, that pertain to clean energy over the past that have been passed in one form or another, <laughs> and he put it all together. Um, uh, he also, there's another gentleman, Senator Barrett, who's been very active in this sphere, and he's actually the one that did the carbon pricing been a little bit of a tension going on between uh, these two individuals um, uh, going back and forth on uh, pieces of legislation. We've done a lot in regards to uh, energy legislation in the Senate, and we're making progress, but there still is, is a lot of a pushback in this. And so um, one of the big issues that I think we're hearing about, and I think, I don't know if any of you caught the Globe on Sunday, uh, the editorial, and there's been a big push to limit natural gas uh, piping piping because we don't want natural gas because we don't want them in the future however what the ultimate um, implications of that are and I, I think the globe has always been somebody that's very supportive of renewable energy is that because of that and we are the, the limitation of energy we've had to then go in those pipe uh, uh, peak seasons or when they're spiking and have to go to, to coal and to go to oil and so we're not only are we using coal and oil which is bad for the environment, it is also very expensive at the same time. And so we have to be mindful, and this particular piece of legislation makes it virtually impossible to do anything with natural gas expansion. Um, in this piece of legislation, and there, there's some really good things um, in this that I think that we need to do, and we really need to do a better job, and the, the goal I think is that we can need to do is st if we can perfect storage of uh, electric power that that would enable us to really take advantage of wind and solar because you can only get it when the wind's blowing or the sun's shining we need to do a better job with storage and that's got to be the number one issue that we need to focus on put resources in to address that um short of that though the reality is is um we can't do it just with wind and solar. We, natural gas is a part. And we've moved away from coal and oil, and we've moved to natural gas. And I think that that's been a, a good thing. It's helped us reduce emissions um, significantly. We've made some progress over, the, over what we did in the 1990s. Um, but we have, to be mindful of, we have to be mindful of the fact that it has to be both and. And so um, to that extent, there are things in here that are, that, are, that are good and they're going to work, but I'll tell you, as broad as this is and the challenge that I've seen legislatively, you just saw the criminal justice bill. It was the Senate did a version, the House did a version, and you found some consensus and common ground. My concern on something like this this late in the season, if, if it's not more um, narrow in scope, what we're going to have is you're going to run into a log jam and you're not going to get it done by July 31st because um, there's clearly sentiment in, in the House, and I'm not speaking to these two individuals, I'm just saying in leadership in the House, uh, that this, you know, this is so broad, and, it's just, and as, as far as legis legislation goes, um, that if they don't take it up in the, in the House, it, it never gets to a conference committee, you don't find consensus. So I think that there's things we can do. This, this is a good uh, blueprint, but it's, it's so broad that I think it's going to have some challenges going through, and that's my... Um, one thing, it's so important that we do something oh, yeah. we soon. Do something. Yes. 
But well, I'm just saying, you, it's better to do something APCC. than to do nothing. And you, you can do all of this, I call aspirational, and then not get some, some important things done. And I think that that's what we really need to focus on that. And as, as wonderful as you may think all this is, you, you need the Senate and the House to agree yes. so then it gets to the governor. You have to have that consensus. And I'm, I'm telling you right now, just being frank with you, and I don't know if my colleagues agree, but we don't have that consensus right now. I totally agree. In the spirit of us all being Portuguese American legislators, there's a Portuguese wine called charamba. It's also a dance. And the dance is going on between two senators right now. Um, and the music's not playing in the House. Okay, as you said, most of the bills were held. They, they had gone to study committee. But what is happening, what I've, I've heard over the last uh, a few weeks, are some of the provisions here, particularly uh, environmental justice. I was talking to uh, the, the representative from Brockton who has an independent environmental justice bill um, that we're having conversations about how do we make, move the mark on some of these pieces, uh, on pieces of legislation that are moving, uh, that are under consensus, that are going to move through the House. But th a comprehensive bill that's this large, uh, I think what we need to do, and when I say we, it's the League, it's, it's those of us that are in, in, in these roles as legislators, we need to not just look at July 31st and think, oh, if we don't have a roll call vote, we lost this thing. We need to look at how the momentum and where the bill, you know, multiple bills were brought together, where the bill is leading up through the end of this formal session and continue to work so that when the legislature reconvenes, we're not starting from scratch. That we've got some of the compromises worked out necessary to move the mark in the next session. Uh, but with, with all of the things that we have and the things that are caught in conference committee already uh, and all of the other things that, that have happened on Beacon Hill over the last year that have really slowed the legislative process down. Uh, I've only been there for four terms, but this, this year has been the slowest process because of outside distracting issues uh, on Beacon Hill. Can we hear um, from Dylan? Um, yeah, well, thank you. I, I uh, support this bill. I, so, you know, there's no greater issue that's going to impact my generation or my children's generation than that of climate change and global warming. I represent more coastline than any rep in the state, probably by far. So it's kind of in my self-interest. If I want to have a district in the future, uh, we should really be addressing this. Um, good news is my, my parents' house might be, you know, uh, waterfront. Um, so, look, so, uh, so I, I talked with Senator Bachico about this, another great uh, Portuguese um, uh, <laughs> senator. Um, <laughs> I know. I swear they're not. Although we're growing. We are growing. Um, so, so back in uh, September of last year, uh, the House took up uh, my bill to sign Massachusetts onto the Paris Climate Agreement as a non-party state actor. Uh, you know, I think this is really important for a number of reasons. Most important is to show that a handful of climate deniers in D.C. do not speak for the people of Falmouth or the people of Massachusetts. And so what the senators, what Senator Bochico is going to do, and we chatted about this, is because that bill passed the House, if you, I believe it's this bill, the, the front section, she's now changed the front section of that bill to be my Paris Agreement bill, and then he's attaching a bunch of things to it in the hopes that that will mean that they'll conference the bills because they already passed ours on the House side. Don't know if that's going to happen, but that is kind of his latest strategy to move this forward, is to conference my Paris bill with you know, his very long bill, but the first like four or five pages are my Paris bill. So we'll see if that passes uh, kind of institutional uh, rules muster. Um, the last thing I'll say, because I know we're pressed for time, is you know, one of the things that I'm really invested in and working on, and we uh, have been writing letters almost on a weekly basis, uh, is for the deep water offshore wind projects 15 miles south of the vineyard. It's in no one's backyard. No one can see them. And it's the windiest place in America. And if you look at, um, you know, if you look at future projections of how Massachusetts gets to 100% renewable, this deep water offshore wind tract is the best way to do it. Because we, ha we have the second most 
solar jobs in America. We have seventh highest solar output. Solar is 1% of, of where we get our energy from. We have a ton of wind here, a ton of wind. We got, <laughs> we, some, some would say too much wind. Um, and so we have a really, you know, uh, I, I come from an economics background. You want, to, you want to invest in your comparative advantage. We have a huge comparative advantage when it comes to wind. 15 miles offshore in no one's backyard is the windiest place in America. If we keep making investments and, and, and raise above the 1600 megawatt procurement, uh, we have a real chance on getting to 100% renewable uh, within my lifetime. And scale title. If we have <laughs> scale title. I'll the make title. that viable. I just could add that um, recently storage has become more available to new batteries that um, are now being installed with solar installations are um, less costly and they may help the situation getting, getting off of uh, fossil fuels. There's a battery fuels. program uh, uh, that the state has and we actually got a bunch of battery, Tesla battery packs out on Nantucket for energy storage. So that is something that the state is, has been investing in. Thank you very much. Well, thank you guys. You gave us a lot of detailed information. And I wasn't able to take notes. I hope somebody did, but we're going to have to get back with you and some, yeah. some of the, oh, that's right. And, and, I, and I got the one about the timing of the candidates night. That's kind of like candidates night 101. Um, but we really thank you. So what I've learned is sending you the information in advance really paid off because you really paid attention to it. I also learned that 10 minutes is not enough for, for one bill. It just is not. So thank you for bearing with us on that. Not it's, when you have two long-winded people like this. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to um, open up for Q&A, and we need somebody to... Um, to pass around a mic, and we need we need two mics for this. Because I need one. Yeah. Wait, is it the lavalier mic died? You we can have, take, we, uh, we, you can take that. We can share. Okay, yeah, thank you. How does that work for television, though? I know you guys so are very tight delegation. These, 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 these are for television. These are for. Please, no speeches. Uh, <laughs> we want your questions. And who would like to start? Raise, raise your hand. Here's one over here. I have a question. No, wait for the mic. A question about housing affordability. Can you now make something permanently affordable if somebody buys a unit? In the past, it could only be for 30 years. Can you now make something permanently affordable? So, so what happens is in regards to that is we, uh, they call it expiring use. So they get tax credits. It's for a certain period of time. As a matter of fact, in this housing bond bill that I speak, that I speak of, there's actually money in there to, let's say, uh, you know, a 40B unit came up and, it's, and we've had this happen around the state and they're at their end and it goes from being a 40B to a market rate. The only way that we can make a difference to extend that so that it stays affordable is to provide the funding mechanism or resources in place to the developer that, that made that investment because at the time they did that under condition, it's almost like a contract. So there is actually funding in this to address expiring use so that it will help pay that so that it will extend, especially where um, this is a place where people have lived and we've had some situations where we've seen people, they've been there, they've been paying $600 and $700 a month for a unit and then all of a sudden it's, it's now lived, you know, it's gone beyond the 30 years and immediately it's jumped up to $1,400. Clearly, that's, uh, there's a, uh, a challenge for those who live there a long period of time. And so that's how we're going to address that um, it, with giving, because you have to incentivize people to do that. Otherwise, you're taking some you know, value away. So that's how you address that. And what about the home ownership? For home ownership? If somebody buys a property under some kind of affordable program, 
after 30 years, again, those lapsed before. It, I, I'm assuming it would be the same type of a concept because the reality is the reason, like, like when you do a, a housing development, 10% have to be affordable. The deal that is made is, okay, this is, this is, the, the, pro, this is the deal, and you, you do these, and that particular house, instead of being 275000 is going to be $150,000, but there's a there's a financial incentive that that developer got at that particular time so that you make affordable units that come on to market. Um, and so the way you can do that is to incentivize them because, in fact, I'll, otherwise you'd be taking property. That, again, but I, that's my thought. And, but we are trying to address that because we know it's a real thing. Yeah, just deed restriction. No, I, perpetuity deed restriction. Another question on affordable housing. I'm Michael Galasso. Yeah. Um, to help you with your question, if the town or the developer uses community preservation money for that affordable unit, it has to be affordable in perpetuity. That's a, that's a requirement of the CPC requirement. Um, but I have uh, uh, two quick questions. One is that the uh, State Department of Housing and Community Development has a budget of about $225 million a year for affordable housing. Of that, a few years ago, they set up a fund for smaller projects, which is typically what we do here in the Cape projects between five and 20 units. But they only put $5 million into that fund of the $225 million that they have. So we're getting a very small amount of that to build affordable housing on the Cape. I'm wondering if the three of you would sponsor a letter to the secretary and undersecretary of DHCD to fund that community skilled housing initiative that they already have to a higher amount than $5 million a year. Yeah, I mean, so the, so I think there's two things to look at. One is is where uh, this discretion is within the secretariat. If if it's under complete discretion, I, I think we actually should set up a meeting um, with Secretary Ash uh, and Under Secretary Cornegue and, and actually have that conversation. The other thing is what I've seen successful in some areas is for some of these projects to look at uh, mass works grants as well to look at infrastructure. Uh, necessary for the affordable uh, housing and be able to go to the MassWorks program to take the infrastructure cost off the development and then to be able to look at the specific development uh, fundings that, uh, funding that's there. Um, so let's, let's follow up on this after, after the meeting. And if, if it's already under the discretionary thing, l let's have the two of them come down and, and let's have a specific conversation about that. I think. The, the second question, uh, just real quick, is that you know, one of our needs here is to house um, our seasonal workers and most of the programs that we would use to build affordable housing all have a requirement that a minimum lease, a lease be a minimum of one year. And as we know, a lot of our seasonal workers are here for a shorter period of time. There needs to be a change in that requirement in some sort of, of form for workforce housing projects, because I know that the Cape Cod uh, Chamber of Commerce is working on some uh, seasonal working programs, uh, housing programs, so, but it's very difficult when the funds that you need are then tied to a minimum lease of a year. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. I was not aware of that, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great conversation to have. And I will say, Jay Ash, who's the Secretary of Housing and Economic Development, um, is very approachable and very accessible. Uh, uh, so my, my thought is that this is, as David said, let's try to sit up, have a conversation. I know that in my, uh, in, and I've been doing this for 20 years, um, I have seen the Secretary down in our area more than I've ever seen in the past. Um, he's on the road all the time, and he really does listen. So I think this is a perfect uh, thing because, I, in fairness, he comes out of the Chelsea area. He's spent a lot of time in housing. That's a really important issue uh, for him, but uh, probably doesn't have the, the vision from how it affects smaller communities. So that, that's very helpful to us, and we will try to bring that back. But I think David's correct. Let's try to have a meeting where we can have a conversation with him directly so that you can, because I think you can, uh, can articulate this better than even we can because you're doing this all the time, and I believe he'll be receptive. I'll just add a couple points, and, and looking forward to working with these guys to send a letter and set up a meeting. Um, one thing that uh, was really helpful in this past bill for the islands in particular was the community investment tax credit. Uh, there's a group, uh, Island Housing Trust, on the vineyard that has built, uh, has raised a um, million dollars uh, just in the past couple of years, just on this um, community investment tax credit. Um, and on Nantucket, uh, Nantucket Housing over there has put in uh, somewhere between six and eight units just off this, off the fundings from this community investment tax credit. Um, basically, it's, it's you know allows people to make donations to these 
um, kind of development corporations and get a tax credit, and they've raised a ton of money uh, on this. Um, it's something I talked with Eric Turkington about, actually, as, as something that, that Falmouth should be looking into um, using, because he's, he's been doing some work in that field. Uh, as well, so I just wanted to I just wanted to relay that that piece of information. I'm looking forward to working with these guys on the letter and the and the meeting. Um, I know gerrymandering was invented in Massachusetts, but would you support a nonpartisan commission to handle redistricting after the 2020 census? I got it. Last time I'll vote for it again. Yeah, I, <laughs> I have a mic in my hand, so I I'm on the redistricting committee. Um, uh, but yes, I, I do support uh, a nonpartisan commission. Massa I, let's give Massachusetts a little bit of credit. Um, they're actually one of the few states in the nation that was not sued after they did redistricting uh, in 2010. Um, and so I'm on the redistricting committee now in the House, and the chair is taking it very seriously and, and wants to keep that track record going. But I do think we should have uh, a non partisan commission, even though it has a long uh, history here with Elbridge Gary, um, actually gerrymandering is, is the, 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 the correct pronunciation. Um, but I think, it, you know, when you look at cases like Pennsylvania, um, um, is, is Wisconsin the latest one? Uh, you know, you see how if it becomes partisan, you see these, you know, packing of districts, you see that, uh, you know, Sometimes this really affects minority populations and that they're either all packed into a district or separated amongst many different districts so they have less of a voice. Uh, I think that, you know, when it comes, I don't think there should be any electioneering in the election process and we should have a fair and transparent nonpartisan system. Cynical enough to think there's po politics in redistricting. <laughs> I, we, I do support it as well. Yeah, we, we've had these votes uh, in the past in the legislature, and they've uh, traditionally gone. This is prior to, to Dylan being there, so I'm glad to hear that we've got his vote this time. Uh, they've gone down on, on party lines. Um, and if you actually look at the history uh, of redistricting in Massachusetts, uh, we had a former Speaker of the House go to prison under felony charges because of the redistricting process. And so I've always been will continue to be supportive of the nonpartisan commission for the redistricting efforts in the Commonwealth. Can I? Can I have one more point? So this is tangential to this, but ranked choice voting. Does anyone know what that is? Okay, all right, so a few hands. So I think ranked choice voting is another really terrific reform. Uh, <laughs> I got a, got a fist pump for that, wow. <laughs> I got a little fired up for ranked choice. Um, we don't for, like these people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so for ranked choice, uh, main is instituting ranked choice. This will be the first election in the nation where we're gonna see ranked choice. They're instituting ranked choice because they elect Paul LePage twice. <laughs> uh, and he won with like 30% of the vote, which is, that's not how our democracy should work. Um, ranked choice allows you to rank in order the people, uh, uh, you know, how you choose who, who's voting. So you rank your, your number one choice one, your second choice two, your third choice three. So it makes it so that people like Paul LePage, who are always going to get 33% of the vote, don't become governor when two other candidates split the vote. So, you know, for these two other candidates, they would have, you know, had probably Paul LePage last and then the first two, the first two candidates. So, so it goes until, so it's kind of hard to explain without a PowerPoint, but you have to get 50% of the vote of first and second choices. Um, and it, it makes it so that our uh, elected officials better represent who the voters chose at the ballot box. It's, a, it's another really important uh, election reform. You vote more than once. You, you, you. Well, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I don't know, that's choices. the best way. And then, if number one doesn't get 50%, you knock off the low vote rater, then you vote again, well, then rank again, and okay. you keep going. Well, I'll, actually, that's not exactly how it works. So you don't, you don't, you only vote once, but you rank the okay. people at the ballot, and then the, la the, 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 the person- You count it more than once. You count it more than once, yes. So the last, the person who got the fewest votes, and then you then split up their second choices 
underneath the other two people on the ballot. And then if that person gets, if, if someone gets to 50%, then they're the winner. And then you keep doing it depending on how many candidates there are. You, you guys should do a PowerPoint on this next year, actually, because <laughs> um, it's actually hard to explain without a PowerPoint, but it's, it's certainly more equitable. And I could actually send one out. I have one for, uh, that might be good for the league. They, they were. Maine's the going to be the first in the nation to implement it. Really? Okay. Hi, um, my name is Rosemary Carey. Um, I'd like to go back to the omnibus bill and direct it to Senator DiMacito. Um, Senator, you said that you were opposed to the omnibus bill because it wouldn't allow us to build pipelines. No, I didn't say I was. I didn't say I was opposed to it. I'm just telling you some of the challenges that I. I, I just okay. highlighted the issue in regards to because I've supported other energy bills that Pacheco has done consistently. I'm just saying this is so broad that it's going to be an issue. And as as I highlighted, uh, the Boston Globe, which is I, I think is probably considered um, a very progressive newspaper, has twice come out in opposition to the restriction of the natural gas pipeline expansions because it's causing a, the negative effect of what one would think is is supportive. And so I, I'm highlighting that as as an issue of of we it needs to be more in scope so that instead of being so broad, we can get the support to do, to do some things to continue to uh, move forward on addressing the issue of climate change, which, I, as I said, I've supported in the past. But I'm being honest in the sense that it is a very broad piece of legislation. Uh, I mean, it's everything. It's every piece of legislation. That, you know, I, just in 20 years of my experience there is, you know, you can do these what they call aspirational, but it doesn't end up getting a vote at the end of the uh, uh, at the end of the year, and, and not, now here we are, May second, and we're July thir July thirty first. We're pretty much done with a whole bunch of budget still to go, debate and other things. So that's that's my point behind that. I'm not saying I'm not going to support it because of that. I'm I'm trying to explain the broader realities of the legislative process. Okay, sorry if I mischaracterized okay. your position. But I did want to know if you're familiar with the increasing body of research that is saying that uh, natural gas or frac gas is not the clean transition fuel that it's touted to be. And that, yes, when it's burned, it's cleaner than coal. But when it leaks, it's like 85 uh, percent dirtier than coal, uh, dirtier, um, uh, uh, stronger a greenhouse gas uh, than carbon dioxide. So um, by continuing to, and I don't want this to be a speech, but by continuing to um, build pipelines and expand pipeline in, uh, fracking infrastructure in our state, couldn't we be better off investing in renewable energy We don't energy do any fracking instead? in Massachusetts, so. Uh, oh, in, I'm well aware we okay. don't have fracking in Massachusetts, but the gas that we get, um, that we use and burn right. is, fracked in right. other communities. So by continuing to rely on frack gas, we're basically saying it's okay uh, to get our, our dirty energy elsewhere. But you, you speak so. of something that I think is probably important as the question of what's transitional. And, and I think the goal is to go totally, you know, is to get to renewable, but, you know, totally 100% renewable. But we have to get there. Today, if we said we wanted to do that, we'd just stop all natural gas and go to renewable. We just couldn't do that. I, I think we all understand that. I'm just, you know, I, I've spent 20 years in the legislature and I've always tried to find realistic, common sense ways to get to somewhere and try to find consensus and balance. And the reality is, is if we stop natural gas today with the force that we require, because there's not, there's not enough wind and solar and hydro, if you look at the portfolio that we have as far as energy, it's just, there just isn't a, enough to do that. So how, how do we get transitionally to, the, to there so that we don't burn coal and we don't burn oil, which is in fact what I believe is happening because, as, as I think we all know, this past year when the, we lost power, people were frantic. They were, they, were, they were upset. Now, that we lost power because of trees down and whatnot. But if you don't have enough power, then what they do is they have to go out and get oil and if there's not enough on the grid. I, and this is ISO. And I've spent a lot of time you know, with ISO trying to understand this to a greater degree about how we're going to get to that point, which is, I think, is laudable. Of course, we want to uh, be less dependent, uh, A, on foreign oil and, and uh, 
and gas, you know, and uh, fossil fuels. But the, but the point is we have to transition to there and we don't want to be using coal and we don't want to be using oil because it's not only is it more expensive, but it is, you know, because it's, you, you need it in peak demand times, it's also, uh, it's terrible for the environment. And so you have to transition away from that and you have to be mindful of that. And by constricting it, it it'll, it's the only thing that forces you because we just don't have enough wind and solar. That's, I, I'm, I'm just trying to be reasonable in that regard and I'm not suggesting that your facts are incorrect I, at all. I'm just saying that, you know, you have to go through that in a way that is, you know, we can get from here to there. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on that? There's, there's one, there's a bill that's been, uh, that's uh, uh, supported by uh, Sierra Club, ELM, Environmental League of Massachusetts, many others um, um, that I'm very supportive of, and it's about closing all of our gas leaks. Uh, we have <laughs> tens of thousands of gas leaks in Massachusetts, it's, I forget, I, I used to have the exact numbers, but something like we lose like $50 million a year because of these gas leaks, but they only cost, are we getting kicked out? <laughs> yeah, we are. <laughs> um, but it, it would only cost, I think, about $10 million to fix these leaks. Um, uh, so this is, this is just a really kind of uh, uh, important piece that we need to be doing, just, you know, fixing the gas pipelines that we have because right now um, it's costing us a ton of money and the gas is just being released into the atmosphere um, hurting our environment releasing additional co2 without being plugged up to begin with um, my one of my freshman classmates uh, filed this bill uh, in the house uh, it's something that she's really pushing for something i'm, I'm signed on to uh, i think that's another really good good step as well Hi, I'm Grant Walker from Falmouth here, Precinct 3. Uh, could you tell me whether you are in favor or opposed to eliminating the caps on net metering? In favor. Ditto. Yeah, yeah that, that's how we got most of the projects done was when we actually went to net metering. So. I, I tell you a little story about net metering. So when Falmouth began its uh, wind energy um, projects, uh, there was a thought that during the peak load um, at the wastewater facility that we would utilize all of the producted, uh, all of the produced electricity on site, and then in the off peak, uh, in the time when the citizens are not in in Falmouth uh, here as summer residents, that we would read, we could redirect the electricity to Falmouth High School. And then we would be able to uh, use up most of the energy with the energy costs that we had at Falmouth High School. And at the time, um, it was before I was a legislator, um, but I, Senate President Murray at the time was at one of the meetings where we were discussing this. And all of a sudden, it became apparent that you cannot uh, run a electrical transmission line down a public way unless you're a public utility. And so we couldn't run a transmission line from our wind turbine to our high school to redirect the, uh, the energy. And uh, I think it was a little in jest, but she said, but, uh, but they're your public ways. And we said, yeah, but they're your laws. <laughs> <laughs> and so net metering, um, the retail version, not the wholesale, the retail version of the net metering came up, and that made the whole project sort of financially, and there were other issues that came down the road, but financially uh, work out uh, to be able to have that retail net metering uh, because we couldn't run those transmission lines and redirect the power ourselves. Would definitely be in favor. If I can comment on that as somebody who's had an experience with uh, municipal net metering, there's another obstacle besides the cap that should be looked at. If the community wishes to move energy from where the community has created it, like putting a sap, putting a uh, putting a uh, solar array in a, in, in a location and using it in another location, still a municipal use. The utility is not required to move that electricity from point A to point B if the existing 
facility, the existing wires are uns insufficient. What the utility is required to do is tell the community how much it would cost to improve the uh, transmission and, and therefore have the community pay that cost in order to get the net metering. But there's just so much incentive for the utility to either inflate that cost outrageously or to delay it outrageously that things just, a lot of projects don't get done. When I was in Chatham on the uh, electric power, you, uh, the electric power committee of the town, we looked very closely at putting a solar array at the Chatham airport and directing that, uh, that energy to another location. And we basically had to give up. We, after years, we couldn't get a, couldn't even get a cost estimate for upgrading those transmission facilities. Uh, Peter Hargraves, uh, I don't want the evening to end without thanking you for the tax on uh, summer rentals and the well-placed purpose of 2.75% to improve water quality on the Cape. And so last time we had this event, you said you were going to deliver it, and thank you for that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'd say I like to come. I know we're not supposed to give speeches, but I think I, I like to come to listen to civil discourse and exchange of ideas among people who would otherwise compete on the platforms from which they run. And it just, to me, says our Massachusetts government is so well functioning. So the question I want to ask is a little bit out of the norm for what's been discussed tonight. I see, you know, I feel like our governor has done a very good job. But yet, there will be five people who are running for governor. And I've seen blue and red candidates, even his own party challenging him. So I would like to hear, as cogs in the machinery of state government that's so effective here in Massachusetts, and even with the most popular governor in the country, or the second most popular governor, I would like to hear, would you make a case for either retaining or replacing our governor in this coming election? <laughs> <laughs> He's got to go. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of our I'll governor. be running for Senate in the yeah, near future. Yeah, I know, right, exactly. <laughs> I, I actually had the, I had the privilege of uh, nominating him at the convention just this past weekend, yeah. so I am a big fan of the governor. But you, you hit a point that is so important, and the point is that I think the reason that the governor is the most popular governor in the Commonwealth. And this is clearly Massachusetts, probably one of the bluest of blue states, and you have a Republican. And why is it that he is so popular? And I'm telling you, it's because he sits and listens to everybody, and we all have a seat at the table. You just talked about the 2.75% thing. We work together, Republican and Democrat, and we built consensus on this issue. We knew how important it was to Cape Cod. This isn't a Republican or a Democratic issue. This was a Cape Cod issue. You work together, you find consensus, and, you, and I think we all locked arms and we made a commitment. Now, David and I were probably in the minority in our party that supported that, but, but we listened to our constituency, not our party. That's what has to happen more in, in government and politics. It's the extremes of the left and the right are driving um, the excitement and sometimes the agenda. And the reality is, is you really have to get to the middle and work with people. And you know that's what I really appreciate about um, this administration is that everyone kind of has a seat at the table. And I, I'm telling you, I'm not, you know, it's not a partisan issue, but I know a lot of my closest friends up there are, are, are Democrats and they really appreciate the governor, not you know, as you know, a member of the other party, but because everyone has an opportunity to be heard. And in compromise, which I know a lot of people's dirty word, it's not. It is. It is what makes um, our government work. It's it's that whole concept. So that's. I, I apologize uh, going on a uh, assault box in this one, but it really makes the difference, and it makes my job far more enjoyable as opposed to just sitting there and throwing rocks and blaming the other side 
um, trying to find that common ground. So thank you for bringing that up, though. I appreciate it. I, I think what's important is that you look at the role of governor and individuals that run for governor, chief executive officer of a sovereign state, run for different reasons. Um, some folks, because it's the next political step, it's something that allows them to move a political agenda that they have and to move forward. Uh, what I've seen with this governor is he sees this role as the ability to manage the Commonwealth, to, quote, make the trains run on time. And they weren't running when he first got here, if you remember. And now they're running a little closer on time, you know. And, um, but he is really into that detail-oriented management. And he knows that the only way he can make that happen is by reaching across the aisle. You know, you won't believe how many Democrat members of the legislature that were in leadership under the previous administration that would come and vent their frustration to me with the go previous governor because he was tone deaf to what was important to their constituents, what was important to making a particular agency work efficiently, but he was really good on what he believed in and getting people passionate about it and moving his, you know, his agenda forward politically. Those same individuals, if you look, how many Democrats in the Massachusetts State Legislature have you seen endorse any Democratic candidate for governor right now? It's not that they're endorsing Charlie Baker. It's just that they're saying there's a relationship now. There's a working relationship between the executive branch and the legislative branch like we've never seen before. I remember, you know, usually when you go for a veto, right, the, the governor sends a veto. Now, you have a Democratic governor, and you have a supermajority, an uber supermajority in the Senate and a supermajority in the House. In nearly every veto that the previous governor sent, 100% vote to override. Every Democrat voted against the Democratic governor, and every Republican voted against the Democratic governor. Now, look over the last three years. When these vetoes come in, we're all over the place. Sometimes I'm with Charlie Baker, sometimes I'm against him, sometimes dealing with him, sometimes he's against him, depending on what the line item is, depending on what it is. But it used to be 100% against the sitting governor, and that's about relationships. So definitely, we need to send Charlie back for four years. Hate to rain on the Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> we gave you a lot of time to think about it, though. Uh, I, uh, and wow, I'm one year in, I'm already a cog, man. Um, that's kind of <laughs> tough. I, uh, look, I, you know, I've worked with the, the Baker administration. We, they worked, we worked together, and uh, uh, he filed a home rule petition on my behalf for the town of Tisbury. Um, they're really responsive. They're really engaging. Uh, his staff's really on the ball when it comes to working with state reps and working with my office. And that's something that I very much appreciate. And maybe, you know, this I've only known Charlie Baker. So uh, that just kind of seems like the standard to me. I mean, I, I have clear ideological differences with Charlie Baker. Um, uh, I think, you know, there's one thing to be a good manager, but I think Massachusetts has a long history of leading the nation with really uh, compelling vision. And we led the nation on so many visionary laws. Uh, and I, I talked about them earlier, healthcare, Global Warming Solutions Act, uh, uh, right to marriage. And I'm a, I'm a progressive guy. Uh, I want uh, some really kind of uh, uh, nation leading policies when it comes to um, you know, helping us move, having a plan to move us to 100% renewable energy when it comes to looking at how Massachusetts can transition uh, to single payer health care. You know, uh, there's a lot of really kind of transformational nation leading policies that I want to see implemented over the course of uh, hopefully my time in the legislature, um, but certainly in the, in the course of the next 10 to 20 years. I don't think we're going to get there. Um, we're certainly not going to get there as soon uh, with Charlie Baker, um, and we might not ever get there with Charlie Baker. So, uh, you know, not everyone has endorsed uh, the Democratic candidate, but people are going to come around in the next couple of months, especially post uh, post primary. A lot of people just don't endorse in the primary um, uh, on the Democratic side. So, uh, so you know, there, there's going to be a lot of support. You know. It's, I think Charlie. I fundamentally think Charlie Baker is a good guy, and I'm I'm happy to work with him. And and on the Cape delegation piece, you know, we do work really well together. Uh, you know, Sarah Peak, Julian Sear, 
um, uh, and myself uh, work really closely with uh, our Republican co colleagues on a number of issues. Local, 90% of local issues are not partisan. And it might even be over 90%. And so when we're thinking what is best for the Cape, it's really important that we are together on a lot of these issues because Boston's got 37 reps, all right? We got six, okay? So uh, it's really important, especially on uh, really generational issues like this, like the Airbnb bill and like this uh, clean water trust that we have as a part of it. You know, this is a really generational change. It has an opportunity of changing uh, uh, our, our clean water for generations. And when we, by the way, when we talked about affordable housing, right? Can't build affordable housing unless we have uh, uh, systems to make sure that they're, they're sewered or at least have nitrogen mitigation systems attached to them. This will allow us to do that. So it's a really generational piece of legislation that I think we're going to be seeing the benefits for, from for a long time. And uh, you know, I was happy to work with my colleagues to move that forward. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Appreciate it. Well done. Yeah. Very good. Well, that's ceremonious. Thank you. Thank you again. Appreciate it. <laughs>